Now, I wish that it were possible to trace the cause of this sermon and never introduce anything else to the cause of this But every electrician knows there are two poles to an electrical system, the positive and the negative. I want to begin by saying that there is a vast difference in tone between the text which I have read and the great Bible giant and the shining soul that have lived in Bible times and present day gospel history. You think, for instance, about the man David, how David sought after the Lord back there in the book of Psalms. As the heart panteth after the one that brooks the whole panteth my soul after the old God. And so, both persons, so God for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? And, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My flesh, my soul is precious to thee. My flesh is longest for thee. In the giant place, the land where no water is. See thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And then he continues and says, My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand doth uphold me. Now that's the language of the man David. You will find it in the Old Testament. You will find it beginning back with uh, Abraham and tracing all the way down through. They were a first people in the law. And the difference between them and us and between the tone of their lives and the tone of our lives is that they sought him and found him and sought him still and then found him and sought him again and found him and sought him more. But we believe on him, accept him and seek him no more. Now there is a difference. And I was uh, in my heart, I can't play uh, but uh, I can um, I can think about some great souls, some great souls. And I was thinking tonight about them. And how their very names are music to us because they are associated. They're dead and gone. And uh, we don't play to them. And uh, they have no virtue for us. They get their virtue where we get ours from Jesus Christ our Lord. Their merit comes from the same fountain ours does. And ours the same as theirs. So we're not deifying them, we're not canonizing them, but the names are music because they're associated with this church that Paul expressed here when he said, I count all things but lost you, doubtless I follow after, if I may apprehend and I forget the things which are behind and I reach forth under those things which were good. The good music to the name of Augustine and Tower and Jacob Bain and Thomas the Tempest and Richard Rowe and Bernard of Clairvaux and Bernard of Cluny and John of the Cross and Madame Zion. Why do those names sound to us? Why do they, do they bring us up like tuning an instrument when we hear them? Not that they're nice names and not that we had anything that you and I don't have potentially in by nature but that they were associated with the longing, thirsting crowd and Nicholas of Pisa and Dan Rashidbrook and Lorenzo Cipolli and Cameron and Henry, Henry Pisa and Samuel Rutherford, incidentally with Henry Pisa, brother, that said there is a difference between hearing a loop sweetly played and only hearing that one has been played. But he said some most Christians are uh, to work to this effect. They only hear that there has been a loop played, but they've never heard it played. Well, that was Henry Cusco. And then there was Samuel Rutherford and Cooper and Heber and Samuel Swain and William Law and John Newton and Samuel Medley and Kay Stephen and Paul Gerhardt and Sennett and Doddridge and you can name them, and their names are musical names, and why? The musical names because they, we associate them with the first souls. We see them as uh, the, the, the deer that's been chased by the hounds, thirsting 
longing for the water, and saying, Let me alone, for my soul is to see God. And they found him, and they sought him again. And what a tragedy it has been in our time that we are taught, believe on him, accept him, and to be no more. And that's where we are today. And what I'm trying to do, my brethren, is to stir you to want to seek God. I don't care so much exactly what you receive at a given time. That's not the point. And you aim the arrow toward the target and you can go away. And leave the target to the arrow to itself. It is direction and motion that matters. If God is the direction, and if we're moving toward God, I'm not so concerned that we have a great emotional upsurge, not at all. But I want to see is, as the old book that I've been quoting from, ever more crying after him, now love it. If that is the testimony of your soul, ever more crying after him, now love it. And you say that, Mr. Tozer, I've heard of people who got blessings like this, and that's what I'm looking for. I hope you will see, but in the meantime, I'm not too deeply concerned, because what you want, sir, is a heart that ever more cries after him thou lovest, and the heart that cry after the one he loves is better indeed than the heart that has settled down to what he has. Now, there's a book of the Old Testament that very few people will read. The serious ones, I don't like to read it because it's a little raw. It's the Song of Solomon. And most people don't read it because they don't know what it means. But it was the, uh, the very, the very joy of, of these great souls that I've been telling you about. Uh, Bernard started to write a series of sermons on the Song of Solomon. And he had only preached the sermons on the first chapter when he died. He finished it over there in glory. But the only the first chapter. I have his book on the song of Solomon. The song that the psalmist sings that we love so much. Oh, thou in his presence my soul takes delight. was taken directly from the song of Solomon. And it is a story of a girl who is very deeply in love with a young shepherd. And yet she is so beautiful that a king demands her favor, and she saves the royal to her shepherd, her simple shepherd who gathers early in the day of the night, and comes to seek her and calls her through the lattice. It's quite, it's quite a wonderful love story indeed, and it has been understood so by the church as being the Jesus, the shepherd, the rejected shepherd, and the world with all it offers as being the king, demanding or coaxing and winning, trying to rule and win our love, while he waits, gathering ladies in the night, and we're to him. That's the story. Well, they've made a great many songs about it. Listen to this one. Sweet is the odor of thy grace, Thy name poured forth through all the place with heavenly fragrances. Thy precious name, the virgin's love, drawn by thy unction from above, they run, they plead to thee. Thou shepherd of Israel, and mine, the joy and desire of my heart, for closer to me than I pine, I long to reside where thou art. Ah, show me that happiest place, that place of thy people's abode. For saints in an ecstasy gaze and hang on a crucified God. If I could even find a company of people that could go that far, I'd be a happier man than I am tonight. Tis there with the lambs of thy flock, there only I cover to rest, to lie at the foot of the rock, or rise to be hid in thy breast. Tis there I would always abide and never a moment depart. Concealed in the cleft of thy side, eternally held in thy heart. These, these great souls that I've mentioned, that's the way they talk about God. But our Christians, I believe on Christ, let's go have a soda. Type of Christianity. Uh, brethren, if you don't have, I said this morning, I repeat it now. If you don't have a return, 
to this time, the thing that I'm teaching about to you now, present day evangelicalism would be liberalism in 30 or 25 or 30 years. Because we always remember that the church never runs on its head. The church runs on its heart. Always remember that. And always remember that the Holy Ghost never fills a man's head. But the Holy Ghost fills a man's heart. And the effort today is to take Christianity and its all learning and all philosophy and all science which is being made by some evangelicals is going to get a cold thumb from Almighty God. And he will let them go their blind way to liberalism at last. You see it little by little by little, protesting they're not while they are. But somewhere God will have himself a people. I don't know where they are. But God will have himself a people. And they will be those who ever more cry after whom they love. Now, I want to point out to you that this is no place for human effort. O man of God says, Be wary in this work, travel not in thy wits nor in thy imagination. He said, Now remember, in your longing after God, don't try to think your way through. Because you see, in all this there is an element of unknowing, a deep divine abyss of the Godhead. I won't settle for anything less. Now, I, I'm not I'm going to try not to be critical, but I won't settle for anything less than the deep divine abyss, the soundless, uh, unrelenting sea of being that we call God. It is there, and it's beyond the power of thought or visualization. And it's utterly and completely futile in trying to think your way through. And that's been our difficulty in the day in which we live. The young man gets hunger in his heart and he goes to see a teacher, <laughs> and the teacher <laughs> sets him down and begins to think of him. He puts his to him, he's all fixed up. And he goes away and says, thank you, thank you, doctor. He's all fixed up, but he hasn't received the thing. He has been taught in his head, but his heart still goes away hungry. Listen to the old man. Of all the creatures and their work, and even of the work of God himself, a man may through grace have fullness of knowledge. Now let's get that. Don't throw the head away, you're going to need it. And so of all the creatures on earth and their works, and even the works of God, can a man have in his head. So that's all right. Uh, through grace, man can have fullness of knowledge, but in God, of God himself can no man think that means. Not that you can't think about him, but that you can't think around him and think equal to him and think up to him. He may well be loved, but not taught. By love may he be gotten, and by love may he be held, but by thought never. How then can we know him? With a devout and pleasing stirring of love, to pierce that cloud of darkness, and smite upon it with a sharp dart of longing love. For it suffices enough and naked in saint direct unto God without any other cause than himself. There's that word himself again, and I have been noting lately how often that word himself occurs. Did you know that this society almost began on the word himself? Christ himself? And it was himself that gave us the, the message. But we're away from it today and we're satisfied with the works of God and the theology of God. But you'll never get there that way, my brother. You'll bump your poor head and you'll never get there because Talk engages the intellectual element in the gospel, and there is an intellectual element in the gospel. Remember that. Remember that one of the attributes of deity is intellect. And there is an intellectual element in the gospel, and that's what we call theology or doctrine. And thought engages theology. Thought engages doctrine and is necessary and right. And However, it is that beyond the intellect which you need and seek. It is that which you can't get through with your through it through your head. Now, one song says the spirit breathes upon the word and brings the truth to sight. When the spirit breathes on the scriptures, how much more wonderful the scriptures are than when they are merely taught, when we, we merely hear them expounded. 
founding of the Word of God, without the Spirit breathing upon it, can be, if not a harmful, at least a useless thing. And we sing sometimes beyond the sacred page, what? Beyond the sacred page, not apart from the sacred page, not away from the sacred page, not contrary to the sacred page, but beyond the sacred page I seek thee, Lord. The sacred page is not to be a barrier to block our way to God. The sacred page is not to be a substitute for God, though it is made that by millions of people. The sacred page is not to be the end, but only the means for the end, and God is the end. It is God that we seek, my brethren, with a naked intent unto God. There we have it. It is suffice it enough, a naked intent direct unto God, and without any other cause than himself. Now, the parent error is that if we have the text, we have the experience. And most evangelicals settle for that. If we have the text, we have the experience. And therein it's all wrong. If we have the text, we have the text. But the experience ought to result from the text. But we can have the text and not have the experience. We, I remind uh, people remind me of an heir, a rich man, a very, very rich man died, and leaves a will. And in that will, he passes on to his only son all of his riches, running into the millions of dollars. And so the heir gets the will, borrows it from the lawyer, and carries it around. And here he is, ragged and hungry, ragged and hungry, begging a crust on the street and walking around in ragged jeans. And they say to him, my poor fellow, you're in bad shape, you're, you're ragged, you're, your skin's going through, and your, your feet must be clear rather like this, and you look hungry, you're pale. Oh, he says, don't talk that way to me, listen to this. And then he opens the will, and unto my dear son, child, I be preach. And then he names bonds and stocks and poverty and yachts. The poor child is satisfied with the will, He's never had it probated, he's never had it taken, he's never gotten anything. He simply has the will. So you and I go around with the disposition. And we're lean and we're hungry and we're pain and we're pale and we're dry. And we can see our, our our the rags that we wear. And some evangelist comes along. And struggles everybody by saying you're ragged and you're, you're hungry looking and you're weak. And we bristle up and say, why, how, how, what a way to talk. What a way to talk. Am I not accepted in the beloved? Do not I have everything there is in Jesus? Is not God my father and am I not an heir with God? And we limp our ragged lonely way down the street. It's forgetting that it's one thing to have the will, it's another thing to have what you will. And the will of God is one thing, but to have the will of God is another thing. But I want to tell you, as the old man said, be thou aware, and don't try to think your way through. Some of you come up to a point where you, you stop your way up as far as you can get, and you'll never get any further with your head now. You might just well put it to rest. I want to give an Old Testament illustration and show how, how this was. I've used this before, but I illustrate with it here. The progress of the high priest into the Holy of Holies. You remember there were three places. There was the outer court, which had no roof over it, and the sun shone down. And when the priest was there, he had the light of nature. Then he passed through a veil, and when the veil fell back in place, that was called the holy place. And then there, there was no light of nature. There was an artificial light. A light that the, the priests themselves uh, made and uh, lighted and kept lighted. But that wasn't enough. There was the holy of holies. That holy spot where the kind of glory burned and burned and burned. And there, there was no light of nature. The old intellect couldn't get in there, 
and there was no artificial light, no ecclesiastical light, no long-tailed coated preacher uh, enfolding in a ministerial room. None of that stuff could help him there. The, 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 it was the supernatural light of God he saw. It was the shining from the, from the mercy seat. And so when the priest got in there, he had nothing, absolutely nothing. Would you like to be a high priest in those days and know that the God that made heaven and earth was dwelling in fire between the wings of the cherubim? That that great God with his thousand attributes and his sea of endless, boundless beings, this terrible God that made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are there, this God built there. And the priest was moving toward that God. And so there was a light above to help him. That's very good. Sure, that's that the denomination. That's that natural thing. Then they went a little further and got an artificial light. That's your, that's your theology. But he had to go on until there was no natural light, no artificial light, but a supernatural shining. And there in the presence of the supernatural shining, he had nothing to protect him but the blood, and he had nothing to assure him but the character of God, and he was all alone. Nobody could go in with the priest. They could help him, his helpers could help him to get the veils apart, but they had to back away with their eyes averted. They could not enter into that holy of the holy. That was a loan for the priest with blood. And the blood protected him from the, from the burning. For he would have burned as a leaf burned in a fire. Except the blood was there to protect him. And he had no assurance, nobody there to pat his back, nobody there to show him a text, nobody there to read to him, nobody there to tell him a story, nobody there to help him. He had nothing but the character of God to assure him, and he was all alone. My brethren, when you meet God finally, it has to be alone in your heart. It will take the crowd to get you converted who haven't been converted. It will take the crowd to get you through to the fullness of the Holy Ghost you haven't had and then don't know anything about what I'm preaching about. But there's a loneliness there. There's a loneliness. I heard a grand old preacher preach it with one of the greatest, two greatest sermons I ever heard in my life. One was preached here by a Presbyterian called the Define Our Religion to God, Old Samuel Glamour. The other was preached by Max Wright when he preached on spiritual aloneness. And there we are, alone. Alone. People don't want to be alone. They, they don't want to be. You young people, you don't want to be alone with God, some of you. You want the crowd around you. You want people there that can laugh. You want people there that can take the feet off. You want friends around you that can support you and comfort you. But if you ever get through, the way you should, and if ever your longing heart finds the water, it's going to be alone. I don't mean you will be others with you, but I mean you will be alone even though you're surrounded by a crowd. You know what I mean? You'll be all alone even though surrounded by a crowd. God has to cut every maverick out of the herd and band him all alone. All alone. He doesn't do it by map, but it's all alone. And though those 3,000 that were converted that day were all converted, each alone, as if there'd been no other. And when the Holy Ghost came at Pentecost and sat upon each of them, said the Scripture, each of them, he didn't say it sat upon all of them en masse, it sat upon each of them. And each one went through this experience as if he had been all by himself. When that remarkable Irish woman that seemed to be able to get God to do anything she asked him to do, this little old woman up in Canada who died some years ago, they said about her, said, Anne prayed as if God were her father, and he had no other children. As if she was God's only child. There's what I mean, my friend. 
We want to help each other and this goes as far as we can. But uh, God wants us to touch through where there is no natural light to help us. We can't lean on anything natural. And where our denomination goes out from under, denominations have their place and I'm not against them, but they can be a great church if we don't watch it. We will lean upon our denomination. I read in a letter in one of the current uh, evangelical magazines of a man who said, I have accepted the doctrines of such and such a denomination and I expect to stay in them, don't bother me. He had allowed somebody else to make up his mind for him. That's why millions of people are contented Catholics, because somebody does their thinking for them. Somebody assures them. Somebody says a word is of, a, of assurance and consolation. And all of their thinking has been done. And all of their responsibility is taken by somebody higher up. And all they have to do is obey. Now, is that unkind? I hope it isn't. I don't mean it to be so. I only say this is why certain great religious uh, uh, denominations can hold their people. They never say, if you and God for it, you have to find God as a role from the water book. You have to seek God alone, and I'll help you and quote scripture and sing to you and do my best, but when he, he meets you, it'll be by yourself. And you can't take an authority of somebody. I, nobody can come and say, all right, it's done. I'm here by now, and as of today, this hour, declare you all right. I almost got there myself in early days. Some, uh, some happy woman said to me, I think you got it. Well, I thank God I found out better. Because that could have been the end of me. Somebody pointing to me and saying, you got it. But brethren, what we want is, I repeat, evermore crying after him thou lovest. And looking for, looking in his direction with nothing, nothing but a naked intent unto himself. And make it intent unto God. I want God and want nothing more. Now what shall we do? Well, Christ has removed all the legal hindrances, for that I am glad. I heard a sermon today by some fellow with a very young voice. I didn't wait to hear him out, so I don't know who he was, and I don't know from where he preached. But he was very carefully pulling all of the nerves out of uh, the passage being justified to the redemption which is in Christ Jesus and so on, telling how that was figures of speech that were being used, figures of speech and figuring that belong somewhere else. And when he was through, all I had was an illustration. Brethren, they can't rob me on two company birds. I won't be robbed. And let them try to rob me, but I won't be robbed. I believe that when Jesus Christ said, He redeemed me, He meant He redeemed me. And I'm not going to be shooed away by some bright fellow who tells me that was a figure gone from a slave market. And when he said, I'm justified, I'm not going to be shooed away by some fellow who said it was an oriental illustration drawn from a, from a court of law. Maybe the, maybe the illustration or the figure was drawn from there. But back of that figure is the hard core of reality. And my life and future and hope depends upon that being more than an illustration. It's a glorious, solid, hard core of fact, harder than the rock of it. So Jesus Christ removed all the legal hindrances. The word legal sparked me off to say that. But yet I just said it. I believe that there's a legal reason why I ought not to go to heaven. I believe that there are governmental reasons why I ought not to go to heaven. I believe that a holy God must run his universe according to holy law. And if he runs his kingdom according to holy laws, I don't belong there because I've broken every one of them either in intent or in purpose. And so there's got to be a justification somewhere. There's got to be a redemption somewhere. Something has to be done to legally permit me to have God and God to have me, and it's been done. Thank God it's been done. Read Romans 3. So remember that every legal hindrance has been taken away, and there isn't a thing that can stop you except yourself. Not a thing in the right world. And all the depth of the fullness of God is yours, 
then there's not a reason why we can't enter in. If we still ever more try after him and look unto him with a naked intent of love. Well then I point out to you that there's only the only way to get in is believe our way in. I have tried to deal with people who try to think their way in. A man used to come to me and talk about the word grace. He was a very deep student and a very deep thinker, I think he was. He read, he read widely and was quite a theologian. And he was trying to equate St. Paul with Charles G. Finney and arrive at a definition of grace that would satisfy him. Well, the last I heard of him, he had become a paranoiac and uh, believed that the United States government, I think it was, was persecuting him or something. Anyway, he was a downright schizophrenic. And he'd gone off, you know, he'd gone off because he was trying to, um, trying to, to, he think he's really in. Oh, brother, you know there's, there, there's a time when all you can do is believe, believe God, believe what he says, believe. And love. Believe in love. The old brother says, For God himself can no man think he may well be loved, but not taught. By love may he be gotten, and by love may he be holden, but by thought never. The great God Almighty that fills the universe and overflows into immense grief can never be surrounded by that little thing we call your head. Your intellect never, never, never. He knows that all he could do would be to stand at the lowest point of the true soul of God and think down there. You never can rise to the face of God. But love and faith rise. Love and faith. These, these, by these we can know God. By love and faith. Now, I, I want to tell you that the very happy knowledge that there are no vacuum in the kingdom of God. You know what a vacuum is? It's an empty place where there isn't anything, not even air. And nature abhors a vacuum, so they say, and that wherever there's a vacuum, unless it's protected by a hard shell, air wreckage in the church, or water, whatever it be. And the kingdom of God also abhors a vacuum. When you empty yourself, God Almighty left us in. And the reason that we're where we are is that we are satisfied with what we have. But if you have been emptying yourself, you'll find that God will rise into the vacuum. Uh, somebody wrote this, Drawn by my redeemed love, after him I follow fast. Drawn from earth to things above, drawn out of myself at last. You must be tell this man yet. Drawn out of myself at last. No less the trouble. And that's the trouble with so many of you, and so many of us. He's never been drawn from earth to things above. Drawn out of myself at last. What a happy hour. When we've been drawn out of ourselves. And there's a vacuum. And into that vacuum, right here, the blessed presence. Listen to this. You must know that it does not consist in anything else than in the knowledge of the goodness and greatness of God and of our own nothing, nor an inclination to ever eat. In subjecting not only unto him, but for love of him, unto every creature. In the renunciation of all will of our own and a complete resignation of ourselves to his good place. And all this should be willed and done by us simply for the glory of God and for his pleasure alone and because he thus wills and meant to be thus loved and served and this is the law of God and text by the hand of the Lord himself in the hearts of his faithful servants. This is his easy yoke and this is his burden life. So wrote the poet, one of the great saints of other days. And here is the wonderful thing, friends. Whenever the Holy Ghost talks, he always says the same thing to everybody. I have mentioned names 
from Augustus, you know, from David on down to later times. And we can read their hymns and read their devotional books, and we find that they all add up to the same thing. A sailor and a hero, a Calvinist and an Arminian, an Episcopalian and a Catholic, if he lived in the day when he was power and life. And they added up to the same thing, so that the Holy Ghost doesn't say two things, he says one thing. And he says the same thing to everybody that's listening to him. And so I can quote from almost anywhere and not be contradicted because the same Holy Spirit says the same thing to all of his children. He says, pour yourself out. Give yourself up to me. Empty yourself. Bring your empty earthen vessels, not a few. Bring them and empty yourself. Same thing. For the glory of God alone they all say. For, the, for God himself says Paul in First Corinthians 1 and 2. Not mentality, not intellect, but the Holy Ghost. Who knows the things of a man, but the spirit of a man that's in him. Who knows the things of God, but the Holy Spirit. So that you can't turn your way up Jacob's ladder, hand over heels into the kingdom. And you can't think your way through. You can only love your way in and believe your way in and come in meekness like a child and drawn by your redeemer's love. Come and pour yourself out until at last you're delivered from yourself. You know that's your only problem yourself. You say if you had a Better pastor, I'd be a better Christian. I wish that could be so, but you know it wouldn't be. The better the pastor that you've got, and the better Christian would be, the more peril you'd be in. Because you would tend to become a spiritual parasite and lean on him. And often the most spiritual people are in churches where the pastor can't preach his way out of a wet paper sack. <laughs> and the reason is that they have no help from the pulpit, so they seek God alone. But if you get too much help from the pulpit, you tend to be a parasite. And lean on your pastor. I don't want you to lean on me. I believe in the priesthood of believers. And I believe there's men here that hear the voice of God as surely as I do. And have as much right to speak as I have. And ordination to me is Virgin said, no man ever laid his empty hands on my empty head. <laughs> and ordination to me is just that. If the God Almighty hasn't called a man, you can ordain him till the cows come home. And he'll still be a baby. So, my brethren, it's just you that you're troubled. Protect you, and if you will get delivered from yourself, drawn out of myself at last, what a, what a noise it'll be when, the, when you're drawn out of your sight. When you suck the fire down in the mud of your own ego, when God pulls you out and there'll be a sound that can be heard a block in you. When you're pulled out of your sight. And you stop thinking of somebody. And you stop thinking of your own Oh, you just a few ladies. You just know so much. Then, God can be loved, and by love he may be gotten, and by love he may be holy, but by thought never. So he said, be careful, don't try to, don't try to enter into the deeper life by your wit or your imagination. Don't try it. But look unto God by yourself. Keep God in your, your own heart. I don't mean it's not all right to go to all of you. Heroines and pray, that's another matter. I'm talking about the loneliness of the soul that may be cut out of the crowd. Cut out all fine sense. Even as a little woman pushed herself toward Jesus. And she was so crushed in the crowd that they were pressing him on every side. But one lonely little woman, surrounded in Christian jockeys, touched his hem in the field. He turned and said, who touched me? And they said, well, that's a clear one. He said, who touched me? And you're in a mouth. Crowded on every side, he pushed me, jostling, he said, who touched me? 
Oh, I didn't mean that, he said. I mean, he touched me with faith. He touched me with love. He touched me. And the rest of them were merely jostled. And so we have crowds, we have meetings where people just jostle a little. That's all. Just jostle. He's there, but they're just jostling. Somewhere, some little soul pushed to his touches. And in love and in faith, he touches him in the heart he feels. You know what a lot of us need? We need to have our hearts healed, you know? We need to have the, the, the ointment put on our hearts. Is there no balm in Gilead? Yes, yes, yes. There's a balm in Gilead. To hear the To my friends, I don't know what else I can say tonight. And I want to leave you and say to you that your beloved is gathering lilies. And if you watch, you see him put his hand through the light and say, Come, my beloved, rise up, for the rain is over and gone, and the singing of the birds is heard in the land. And if you're not like the poor bride, you know what's the matter with her. She said, Oh, I've got ointment on my hands. They use it even back there. She said, I've got ointment on my hands, and I have my night garments on. I'm all on my couch. I can't possibly get up. And so sadly he went away. And then her heart began to condemn her. And she jumped up to her old arm and started acting, but she said, I couldn't find you. Oh, you daughters of Zion, she said, declare, have you seen the star that on Israel shone? That's what's the matter with it. He had come and tapped on the ladder. She said, I can't come now. I'm sorry, honey. I'm all covered with ointment. And he went sadly away to his work among the lilies. But she followed him, and the watchman saw her and banged her around, and she went to the virgins and said, Have you found him? And they said to her, What is he? What is he above others that you are looking for? And oh, she said, He's altogether lovely. And I was fool enough to miss it last season. I was fool enough to miss it. He called and said, Come on, come on, it's springtime. And I didn't hear him. I heard him, but I didn't have the hard to go, now I see what I've missed, and so she was searching for him. And at last she said, I found him whom my soul loved. And when she found him whom her soul loved, finally, who is this that comes forth? Here is the sun, and brighter the, brighter the sun, and clear as the moon, and terrible as an army was done. But none other than that same beloved. Oh, my friend, she's very near to us. There will never be any place that's very near. He's grieved and he's sad, but he's very near. And he waits. He waits for a vacuum to form inside your heart. He says, what is in my heart? Well, I don't know. But whatever it is, it's got to get out. And when you pour it out, he comes in. Believe it. Will you do it this evening? By yourself. Don't lean on somebody beside you. Don't trust somebody else by yourself, alone. Now, I wish that it was possible to preach the cause of this sermon and ever to do anything else but the cause of this sermon. But over the next week, you know, there are two souls who are like little Christians, positive and the negative. I want to begin by saying that there is a vast difference in tone. Between the text which I have read and the great Bible giant and the shining souls that have lived in Bible times and the present day gospel Christians. You think, for instance, about the man David, how David sought after the Lord back there in the book of Psalms. As the heart panteth after the one that did the whole panteth my soul after the old God. And so about searching for God, for the living God, and when shall I come and appear before God? And, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My flesh, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. In the dry and place the land where no water is. See thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And then he believes and says, My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand 
prophet told me. Now that's the language of the man David. You will find it through the Old Testament. You will find it beginning back with uh, Abraham and listing all the way down through. They were a testament to the law. And the difference between them and us and between the tone of their lives and the tone of our lives is that they sought him and found him and sought him still and then found him and sought him again and found him and sought him more. But we believe on him, accept him and seek him no more. Now there is a difference. And I was uh, gaping my heart, I can't play uh, weak, but uh, I can um, I can think about some great souls, some great souls. And I was thinking tonight about them, and how their very names are music to us, because they are associated, they're dead and gone, and uh, we don't play to them, and... Uh, they have no virtue for us. They get their virtue when we get ours, from Jesus Christ our Lord. Their merit comes from the same fountain ours does, and ours is the same as theirs. So we're not deifying them, we're not canonizing them, but their names are music because they're associated with this church that Paul expressed here when he said, I count all things but lost, you doubtless I follow after. If I am apprehend, and I forget the things which are behind, and I reach forth under those things, it was this that gave music to the name of Augustine, and Tower, and Jacob Bain, and Thomas the Tempest, and Richard.